coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. And our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Let's make way before the King of Kings this morning. So open up the gates, make a way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. And our God is the Lamb. Slain for the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Let's declare that this morning. Yes, no one can stop the Lord. And who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord? And our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow be. For him, our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Oh. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God and standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail and by the living word of God I shall prevail standing on the promises of God and standing, standing 
Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. And standing on the promises of Christ the Lord. Bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. And overcoming daily by the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God. And standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. And I'm standing on the promises of God. And standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God.
kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died praise the Father praise the Son praise the Spirit three in one God of glory majesty from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born and the Spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of all shall not kneel, shall not fade by His blood and in His name in his freedom I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the We just come before you today to celebrate your living word, Lord, that came as Christ Jesus, God. As the word became flesh and dwelt among us, God, we thank you for Christ who came to fulfill all the law and the prophets. And so we praise you this morning, Lord. God, we thank you for your word, for your divine inspiration and love letter to us, God. Now, God, we know Christ was not plan B, but he was plan A, God. And so as Tommy comes and brings the message from your word, God, just open our hearts, speak to us this morning. Speak through him, God, use him in Jesus' name. Amen. Open up our 
ears to hear, speed us in your truth. Show us Christ. Show us Christ. Oh God, reveal your glory through the preaching of your word until every heart confesses Christ is Lord your word is living light upon our darkened eyes guards us through temptation the simple wise. Your word is food for famished ones, freedom for the slave, for riches for the needy soul. Come speak to us today. Show us Christ, show us Christ, oh God, reveal your glory through the preaching of your word until every heart confesses Christ is Lord. And where else can I go, Lord? Where else can I go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else can I go, Lord? Where else can I go? You have the words of eternal life. Where where else can I go, Lord? Where else can I go? You have the words of eternal life. And where else can I go, Lord? Where else can I go? You have the words of eternal life. Show Christ, show us Christ, oh God, reveal your glory through the preaching of your word until every heart confesses Christ is Lord. Well, today we find ourselves in Acts chapter 17. If you would turn there in your Bibles, and while you're turning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that was so emphasized in our music today. We know your word is alive, it's powerful. And Father, we pray it would be that to our hearts. Father, we would allow your word to find good soil and that it would grow in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name, the giver of the word of life. Amen and amen. The heart is a fascinating organ in our bodies. Did you realize that the heart pumps blood through 60,000 miles of blood vessels? Do you realize that a woman's heart beats eight times more in a minute than a man's heart does? 
that the human heart weighs about a pound, and it is about the size of a full-grown man's fist, the human heart. It is amazing that on this one day a week that there are more heart attacks recorded than any other day of the week. Somebody tell me the day of the week. Monday. Monday. There's something about Mondays that really bless us. And there's one holiday that records more heart attacks than any other uh, holiday. You know what that would be? Father's Day. No, I'm joking. Uh, uh, Christmas. More heart attacks happen on Christmas than it's the wife that drives the guy crazy. You know, like, we're not going to be ready, right? And uh, that happens on that day. But the human heart, it's fascinating for so many reasons. But it is also fascinating how it responds to the gospel. Now, we're in Acts chapter 17, but you remember two weeks ago we were in Acts chapter 16. And we discovered the responsive nature of the heart. We find there are certain hearts that are seeker hearts. There are certain hearts that are secular hearts. And there are certain hearts that are skeptic hearts. And each took a different approach to the gospel to bring that heart around to acceptance and the lordship of Jesus Christ in their life. But today, we find that we're in Acts chapter 17, and we find three different locations that Paul and his companions went to. And these three different locations, they responded differently to the gospel. And the reason that we're exploring this today is to expose our own hearts. We pray that God would expose our own hearts of how we approach the gospel in order that we might deal with our own hearts to make them more sensitive and more clinging to hear the Word of God in our own lives. We find that Paul, Silas, and Timothy They were in Philippi, but now they are leaving Philippi. You remember that Paul and Silas, that they were beaten, put in prison. And now they've been released, and now the Jews were causing problems. So Paul, Timothy, and Silas, they leave. And we believe that Luke stayed behind. We find that Luke seems to be staying behind to help this fledgling church really get started and rooted in the Lord. And so the three of them, they leave. And they are going down what we call the Ignatius Highway, the Ignatius Road. And we find they're traveling through that way. And we find they leave Philippi, and notice they go to Amphipolis, which is about 30 miles away. And from Amphipolis, they go to Apollon, which is about 30 mile trip, and Apollon to Thessalonica, which is 40 miles. Now, people believe that Paul had to take a horse or some kind of beast of burden to get there. Because if you add these up, Paul was traveling a, a great extent, and most believe that Paul did that in three days. And so if Paul were to do that in three days, he had to ride something to make that time up. But it only makes sense, doesn't it, that Paul was already beaten, put in prison, that he probably wasn't physically able to travel without maybe some help and some aid at that time. And when Paul arrives in Thessalonica, we find Paul hits a huge city. A population of that time, listen, about 200,000 people. It was a seaport city, so people were coming and going. It was a, a bustling city. It was a, a vital community to live in. It was the capital of Macedonia at that time. And so Paul arrives at a hub of where people were coming and going and, and trading at this time. But we find something about the Thessalonica's hearts. They were resistant to the gospel. Listen to what it said. They were resistant to gospel. But I want to ask you, are you resistant to the gospel? And not that you just close your mind to it and you, you push it away, but when you hear it, do you kind of hold it at a distance? 
Do you find that when you hear the gospel, you say, well, I need to think that through? Do you find in your own life, like the Thessalonians, that you are resistant to the gospel? I want you to follow me, beginning in verse 2. Notice what is happening as Paul arrives there. Now, according to Paul's custom, he went to them, to the synagogue, for three Sabbaths, to reason with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus who I am proclaiming to you is, notice, the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. And so we find that the gospel did make a difference there. The gospel did, but in, in, a, in a bigger sense, it was resisted when Paul was there. But Paul would go into the synagogue as his custom, and he would meet the Jews, the God-fearing Greeks that were there in the synagogues, and notice how he approached it with the Thessalonians. Paul began to notice in verse 2, it said he reasoned with them. He reasoned with them. The word for reason is where we get our word in English for dialogue. And so what we find is that as Paul went in, he began to dialogue with the people there. He began to open up for questions. Anybody have any questions of what I'm saying? Paul would ask them questions. They would respond back. And so we find it was a a give and take time while Paul was in the synagogue with them. He opened it up to dialogue with the people. But notice in verse 3, it says that he explained to them. The word explain in the Greek is a compound word. The beginning of the word, the, the prefix is di. It means through, between. Uh, the suffix means a go. It means to open, to remove. And so the word literally means to open that which was closed. The same word to explain is also used in Acts chapter 7, verse 56, describing Stephen as he was stoned and, and that the heavens were open. It's the same word used in Luke chapter 24 on the road to Emmaus, the two men. Their eyes were open that it was Christ that was with them. It's the same word in Acts chapter 16 that refers to Lydia's heart, that her heart was open to the gospel. And so as Paul is explaining the gospel in the synagogue to them, he is praying that their hearts will be open, that their hearts would be open to the gospel, that they would receive the gospel in their lives. And so Paul was reasoning with them. He explained the gospel to them. But notice in verse 3, what else did Paul do? Paul gave them evidence. Gave them evidence. The word evidence means to lay along beside, to lay something beside. And so here's Paul is, that he's giving all these Old Testament scriptures. What do you think he's using? I would imagine he would use Psalms chapter 2, Psalms chapter 16, Isaiah chapter 53. He would lay the scriptures out, and then he would place Christ beside the scriptures and say, look, look how the scriptures prove that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is the Messiah. He is the one to come. And so Paul gave evidence to who Jesus was. And then notice what it says, that he declared that Jesus is the Christ. It wasn't a seeker-friendly service that day, was it? But Paul said, listen, there is no question that Jesus is the Messiah. Christ means the anointed one. If you would take that word, Christ, and place it in the Old Testament rendering, it would be Messiah. And he's saying, look, he's the one that you've been waiting for. He is the one that you've been longing for. Jesus is the Christ. And so the gospel went out. But notice the response in verse 5. About halfway down in verse 5, it says, They formed a mob and set the city 
in an uproar. We find they were resistant to the gospel. Resistant to the gospel coming to them. And now the city's in an uproar. When the Thessalonica received the gospel, it took time for those that were in the synagogue, those who believe, it took time for them to receive it. But the others that did not receive it, men, they were resistant to it as well. And they threw the whole city in an uproar against these men. But Paul reasoned, <coughs> excuse me, Paul explained, Paul gave evidence. And many times when people look into the mirror of the Word of God, there is that resistance to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was an old Tennessee hillbilly man. Man, he was everything that you would picture of a hillbilly person to be. He knew nothing about modern life, civilization, or nothing. But one day as he was walking through the woods, he came across abandoned campground. And there he noticed there were some food supplies, some camping gear that was kind of left behind. And then he picked up something of a mara. And he looked in it, and it startled him when he looked in it, and it scared him. And he said, I'll be a picture of Pappy. And man, he got sentimental over that picture and got kind of emotional over it, went back to the house, he went into the bedroom, and he lifted up the mattress, and he put it underneath the mattress. What he didn't know, his wife was watching. And she was wondering, what was he doing? So she lifted up the mattress, pulled out the mirror, and she looked in, and she was shocked what she saw in that mirror. She said, so that's the old hag he's been running around with. We find that the mirror of the Word of God reveals a lot of things. And we find that many times we're resistant to it and, and stand off, and that's what it was like for the church of Thessalonica. They had resistant hearts. But Paul leaves there, and he travels to a community called Berea. Berea was 45 miles away, and it was totally, totally different than Thessalonica. Cicero records, he said, it's the off the beaten track. What we would say, it's in the back woods, it's in the sticks. Instead of a population of 200,000, it was a population, they believe, about 10,000 at that time. And it was kind of an off-country old town, totally different than what Paul was experiencing in, in that great population area of people from around the world that were coming and going. This was an isolated area. But Paul did what he normally did. He went into the synagogues, and he began to teach the people there. And notice what he found there as he went in, beginning in verse 11. He found a unique character among the Bereans. There was a unique character that was there that Paul found that he did not find in Thessalonica. It was a different, for notice verse 11 what it says, that these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. That these that were in the synagogue, these that Paul was teaching the gospel to, they were more noble-minded. What does that mean? Linsky says it this way, that the Brians were better Jews because they have embedded the true spirit of Israel and the Old Testament. They have allowed the grace of God to mold their hearts through the Old Testament Scriptures. Paul found that the Brians, they were more noble-minded. But Paul also found a unique response to them, a receptivity that they had. And so their hearts were receptive to the gospel. Notice what he found in verse 11. They receive the Word. You see that in your Bibles? They receive the Word. It was like, come on. Man, I welcome you. I welcome the Word of God in my life. I want to hear it. I'm excited. I, I welcome. Tell me more, Paul. Tell me more, Silas. Tell me more, Timothy. I, I want to hear the Word of God. We find 
that they received the word. But also we find in verse 11, they were eager. Notice they were eager to hear the word of God. I mean, they were excited. I'm telling you, it makes a difference for a speaker to go somewhere and, and people are sitting back with their arms folded, half listening. Or when they're sitting on their edge of their seat saying, man, I want to know more. I'm eager to hear. I'm excited to hear. And Paul says they were eager to hear the Word of God. I had a friend that was a taxidermy. And he would make fun of me all the time because at that time I was living in Arkansas. And he would come back all the time. And he said, man, I won all the awards. I beat all those Oklahoma people. And he, he would make fun of me all the time. But he had a dog that we would use at the church for like wild game banquets and stuff. And that dog, he would put uh, a hat on him and he would dress him up. But one of the things he would do, he would put a dog bone on his nose and he'd just leave it there. And he said, hey, listen, he said, don't move, don't eat it. And man, that dog would just be sitting there with those eyes crossed, you know, like he needed help. Those eyes were crossed. And he just kept looking at that dog bone that was resting on his nose. And man, that dog would be slobbering. That dog would be waiting. And that dog would be so hungry until he said, you can eat it. And he would throw it up and eat it. And Paul says, man, the Brians were like that. Man, they, they were just slobbering for the Word of God. They were hungry for the Word of God. They were eager to hear the Word of God. They were excited that Paul was telling them about God's Word, but also notice in verse 11 what it says. That daily they were examining the Scriptures. Oh, so Paul said this, let's check it out. Let's check it out to make sure it's right. And so they would get the scrolls of the Scriptures out and, and they would examine it and say, yeah, that's right, that's right. And so daily they were examining the Word of God to making sure what Paul was saying was true. But also notice the word examining there. It's the same word that is used in uh, Luke 23, 14, speaking of Pilate, examining Jesus and said, I find no fault with him. It's the same word in Acts 12, 19, when Peter was released by the angels and Herod then began to examine the guards. We find hearing what they were saying. They examined the scriptures and they were saying, man, this is real. This is real what you were saying. But I also want you to notice the word daily. They were daily devoting themselves to the Word of God. They were in the Word, reading the Word, studying the Word, examining the Word. Notice verse 12, what it says about them. Therefore, many of them believed along with the number of the prominent Greek women and men. Their hearts were receptive to the gospel. Man, their hearts were acceptive to the gospel. For we find, first of all, they received the Word. They welcomed the Word in their life. Man, we want the Word. Second, they were eager to hear the Word. They were eager. They brought the Word in their lives. They wanted the Word. And then daily, they gave themselves to the Word of God in their lives. The Brians were receptive to the Word of God. But thirdly, I want you to know the Athenians, they rejected the Word of God. There's a lot of controversy of whether Paul sailed to Athens from Berea or whether Paul traveled by land all the way. And the reason there's so much controversy is because of the manuscripts, uh, the oldest manuscripts, there are some variant reading in them. And so we'll leave it to the scholars to figure out how Paul came to Athens, but here's what we know he came. For notice verse 16. When Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him, and he was observing the city full of idols. We find it was a very pagan place. Pick up with me in verse 18. And also some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. And some were saying, what this idle babbler. The word babbler literally means seed picker. It's a picture of a bird pecking seed. It's an idea that somebody has picked up something from Fox News, CNN, ABC, and they're just throwing out all these trivial things that they know from different places. And they said, who is this 
babbler, this seed picker, wished to say. Others seemed to proclaim of a strange deities because he was preaching Jesus as the resurrection. Look in verse 19, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. For you are bringing some of the strange things to our ears, so we want to know these things mean. Now, verse 21. Now, the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling and hearing of things. And then notice Paul's response, how they responded in verse 32. And, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst, but some of the men joined him and believed. You see, the soil there was hard. Some believed, yes, but the majority rejected the message of what Paul was proclaiming. The soil of the Athenians was hard. They, they rejected the truth. So as we began this morning, we talked about the heart. And there's three responses to the Word of God that we've seen today. One is a reluctant to the Word of God. Second, we find that one was responsive to the Word of God. And thirdly, one rejected the Word of God. As a believer here today, I want to ask you, how do you respond to the Word of God? I want to ask you, are you reluctant when it comes to the Word of God? That do you kind of hold it off and you say, you know what, I hear it, but I'm not going to allow it to impact my life totally. I'm not going to obey it yet. I'm going to ponder it. I'm going to think about it. I, I'm not that eager to hear it. I'm reluctant. You're going to have to prove it to me first. It's not a soil that's ready and and receptive to hearing and obeying the Word of God. Is that the story of your heart? That you sit here Sunday after Sunday, and when you hear the Word of God, it's nothing that you just embrace and, and put your arms around and, and draw it in, but there's kind of a, a standoff nature to the Word of God. That's how the, the Thessalonians were when they heard the Word of God. Or would you respond and say, my heart's more like the Bereans? Oh, man, I, I can't wait till another week goes by to, to hear the Word of God proclaimed publicly. I'm, I'm like the Bereans. I, I want to hear the Word of God. I'm eager to hear the Word of God. I, I welcome the Word of God in my life. I want to receive it. I want to respond to it. I, I want to be a part of the Word of God living and dwelling in my heart. Is that you? Or as a believer, would you say that you have rejected the Word of God? Here's what I mean by rejecting the Word of God, that you don't read it every day, that you hardly read it at all. Maybe you'll pick up the daily bread. Folks, I'm not against the daily bread. I, I get a lot of illustrations out of it, but it's not reading the Bible. Or if you reject the Word of God because you're not reading it every day, you're not in the Word of God, you're not examining the Scriptures, that you don't find yourself delighting in it, it's not a habit in your life. And my friend, if it's not a habit, if it's not a, a daily part of your life, you're rejecting the Scriptures. And so today, would you ask God, to give you a Berean heart, a heart that wants and desires to have the Word of God and hearing it and obeying it and receiving it and welcoming it in your life. Only you can say what your heart is like. But would you ask the Holy Spirit as you bow your heads and close your eyes to reveal really what kind of heart do you have? Is it a heart like the Thessalonians that's kind of resistant to the Word? Kind of stand off? Not very welcoming of the Word of God? 
Are you like the Athenians? That you don't read it. Oh, you say you believe in it, but you don't read it. You don't examine it. You don't find delight in it. It's not your habit to be in it. And so heart like the Athenian heart? Would you ask God, God, give me a, a heart like the Brians. Give me a heart that desires to hear your word. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are still closed, I wonder if you've come today and your heart has been stirred and you've never received Christ and maybe your heart's been kind of like the Thessalonians' heart that you have kind of resisted it. You've pushed it off, the calling of, of God to be the Lord of your life, and you've resisted it. Or maybe you've been like the Athenian's heart, that you've just said no, you've rejected it. But today, the Word of God has found its place in good soil, and you need to receive Christ today. Man, we would welcome you in the balcony on the main floor to do that. And I'll be here at the front, and I'll help you in that decision. Just coming to the front won't save you. But it's by coming to the front that you're saying publicly that I want to receive Christ, and we'll help you to how to make that decision today. You know, the heart, it's amazing, isn't it? But also it's amazing how the heart responds to the gospel. God, give us a Berean heart. God, give us a heart like that today. Father, we give this service to you today and pray that you would break our hearts. That we would find our hearts wanting to hear your word, wanting to study your word. Father, draw that one to you today. Draw that one to you today. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let us stand and sing our hymn of invitation. Holy words and long preserved for our walk in this world and they resound with God's own heart oh let the ancient words impart and words of life words of hope give us strength help us cope in this world where we roam oh ancient words will guide us home ancient words ever true changing me and changing you and we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart and ancient words ever true changing me and changing you and we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart words of our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice oh heed the faithful words of Christ and ancient words ever true changing me changing you and we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart and ancient words 
ever true, changing me and changing you. And we have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. And we have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. 